Good evening, everybody. Please be seated. Thank you. Alan, can you just confirm when we're live on YouTube, please? Uh, good evening. I'm uh, Councillor James Lark, Mayor of Tunbridge and Morling and Chair of the Full Council. Welcome to this meeting of the Full Council, which will be followed by a special meeting to consider a motion in respect of Honorary Freeman. Your attention is drawn to agenda item one which sets out the guidance on how meetings will be conducted, including the ground rules. For the benefit of those who may be observing, proceedings on our YouTube channel, members and officers will introduce themselves when invited to speak. Uh, moving swiftly onwards, item two, apologies, please. I've received apologies from councillors Bank, Hope and Hickmott. Thank you, Alison. Uh, item three, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? None. Stunning silence. Thank you. Item four, the minutes to confirm as a correct record the minutes of council held on the 20th of February as set out on pages 11 to 20. Do I have your agreement, please? Thank you. Item five, Mayor's announcements. Oh, right, here we go. Um, right, a wild and varied bunch. Um, <clears throat> Since the last council meeting, I've visited several schools, um, but some memorable events have included um, an annual community concert for senior citizens um, at Tunbridge School, the uh, 17th Tunbridge Scout and Guide Bands Spring Concert, which morphed into something. And Councillor Borton is just smiling at me because I was sitting there with my good lady wife minding my own business when somebody appeared with me with a mouthpiece read, dragged me on stage and made me play the Wombles team. Highly appropriate, some of you might have said. Um, we attended Tunbridge Angels football ground with Furnham Holmes when the Slade Primary School's under 11 girls football team were given their new kit because they were playing in the Southern Region final at Slough Town. Uh, they were thoroughly excited and they were wonderful, these, these children. And um, we did hear that, unfortunately, they didn't make the grand final at Wembley by one point on a last minute goal scored by none other than Slough Town. Um, went to the chairman of Kent County Council's flag raising ceremony on Commonwealth Day. I went to the Tunbridge Lions charter night, which I didn't know whether I was a member or I was a guest, but they accepted me as both, which was fine. Um, the mayor of Dartford's charity cabaret night. Um, I went to a Fantastic Lamps production at the E.M. Forster Theatre in Tunbridge, Return from the Forbidden Planet, which was the music was stunning. And uh, just recently, um, the, uh, I attended uh, Kings Hill Golf Club, 
with the Kent Golf Autism Acceptance Week event. A um, number of autistic children were there to have a go at golf. Um, they were amazing. And then they said, oh, would you like to hit a few? Oh, thank you. 25 years since I hit a golf ball, but I managed to get one out the ground, off, off the ground and in vaguely the right direction. Keith Tunstall, uh, the first person I bumped into there was him um, practicing, but he did show me where to go because this building was in the middle of nowhere. But yes, um, Deputy Mayor Steve attended several events, which I thank him. There are other events coming up, um, but they will be publicised in the normal way. But I am holding something in this chamber, two events actually, on the 18th of April and the 9th of May, uh, primary school debates. Yeah, they might be slightly more unruly than you lot, actually, but mm -hmm. hey-ho, there, there, it was, it, we, we said it was 10 schools and uh, we were oversubscribed, which is absolutely fantastic. And we're talking about um, sugary sweets, in sugar in diets. So um, that should provoke um, an interesting debate um, and we'll see how we go. But uh, that's basically what I've got. But we still continue to the end of my tenure with further events, which I will report on at annual council. Thank you. Uh, item six, questions from the public. Thank you, Worship. None received. Thank you very much. None received. Item seven, question from members, please. None received, Your Worship. Thank you. Item eight is leader's announcements. Uh, he has 20 minutes and then each group leader has three minutes to respond to anything raised by the leader in his announcements. Uh, no introduction of new or other business. And the group leaders will all have a right. The leader has a right to reply after their comments. So, Councillor Borton, please. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship. We've had uh, lots of speeches tonight and the same speech six times from Mark Rhodes. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll keep this reasonably brief or as brief as I can. Um, this is obviously our first full council meeting since we celebrated the 50th birthday of Tunbridge and Morning Borough Council earlier this month. So to recognise this achievement, we are reflecting on the concept of serving our community, which has been evident throughout the proceedings earlier tonight for those of you who could attend, where we celebrated six former colleagues in Vivian Branson, Mark Davis, Anne Kemp, Brian Luca, Howard Rogers and Janet Sergison, who have devoted and dedicated service to residents up and down the borough for probably tens and probably even over 100 years between them. They are the epitome of what this council is about and the sort of members that we all should aspire to be. And some of our current cohort are doing amazing things as well. And I wanted to use this moment to reference what Colin is doing in memory of his daughter, Amy Williams, with the memorial bike ride that took place a couple of weeks ago. Um, Colin, yet again, led a very brave team of uh, amateur cyclists as they battled the challenging weather on the day um, to cycle from uh, Red Hill to Rochester to support Kent, Surrey and Sussex Air Ambulance Service. Nearly 21,000 has been raised to date um, in Amy's memory, and this funding will make such a huge difference to a charity that Colin cares so deeply about. And thank you to many people towards that as well. The motto of serving our community extends beyond individual achievements and does rightly underpin everything we wish to do as a council. The purpose of the council is to facilitate the great work of groups and organisations in the borough, in the public sector, the private sector, the third sector, and allow community organisations to flourish. The latest round of the Community Development Grant Scheme has been bolstered significantly and there's still a little time to apply. Last time we received so many high quality applications and I know that that money is already being used really well by a number of the organisations who are successful receiving it. We, I said this last time and I'll keep saying this again and this applies to any of our grant schemes but please do share these widely in your wards because we want the money to be spent don't we Sharon and um, we also want the money to be spent locally on things that make a difference to us. 
Now, talking of grants, I have some good news from the public sector decarbonisation scheme tonight. And this scheme is aimed at making our buildings as energy efficient as possible. And we bid for air source heat pumps to be installed at Larkfield Leisure Centre. So I'm very pleased to announce that we've been awarded a huge grant totaling £1,164,760 to help with this project. I'm informed by Robin Betts, who will be able to answer any questions on this better than me, that that will save 185 tonnes of carbon emissions. And my thanks to Robin and all the officers, including uh, Carrie, our climate change officer, who worked very hard on this um, for putting together such a great scheme. Worth noting that we're going to have to contribute £158,831 in order to unlock this funding, but I would argue that is a small price to pay given the amount of money that we're we're getting in for this. This is in addition to the 405,000 by Sports England to fund energy saving measures at Larkfield Leisure Centre too. This will include new solar panels and LED lighting, which will help cut both the running costs and carbon emissions of the Leisure Centre, given the 190 solar panels on the roof that we fitted last year. These are big numbers, impressive numbers, and an impressive scheme. And Another big number that attended, but in a very different way, were those at the inaugural West Kent Expo at the River Centre last month. This, a, this event was something that was put on as part of the Invest in West Kent um, series through the West Kent Partnership with Seven Oaks District Council and Tunbridge Wells Borough Council. And it was aimed at our business community to encourage networking and for local organisations to help show that West Kent is open for business and there's great benefit in working and collaborating together. In total, over 500 people attended throughout the day and 60 businesses exhibited. It was a wonderful event and the feedback afterwards has been brilliant from all as well. I was, again with Robin, he seems to be following me around a lot, at the opening of the expo. And um, in my opening remarks, I uh, tried not to offend anyone in Tunbridge Wells and Sevenoaks, but I did refer to Tunbridge and Morlin as the economic powerhouse of West Kent. And given our strategic location on the A21 and the River Medway, even some of our colleagues in our neighbouring districts couldn't argue with that. Now, straight after the expo that day, I walked over to Sainsbury's in Tunbridge because that was the same day that they were exhibiting their new plans for the um, regeneration of that store that obviously has been discussed at the Finance Regeneration and Property Scrutiny Select Committee a few weeks ago. Uh, it was really good to see their plans. They were well received by uh, residents and Sainsbury's have uh, committed to an ambitious timetable to implement these. And I think that's going to be of great benefit to bring the former Beals unit back into use. And I passed on my own thoughts to Sainsbury's, which was broadly positive as well. Now, of course, reducing empty shops is something of great importance to all of us, whether we're in towns and villages. And sometimes these can become magnets for antisocial behaviour. For quite some time, we've been concerned about this and have worked closely with Kent Police to try and combat antisocial behaviour across the borough. We've got public space protection orders in place that are very clear in terms of what we expect to be enforced. There's always been a gap at the heart of this. The gap has been what enforcement that we can do as a local authority to complement what is happening by Kent Police and other partner organisations. Last week, our new antisocial behaviour enforcement officers started work around the borough. And the reports that have come through so far have been really quite fascinating because they're delivering exactly what we hope they would. And I'll just share one with you today because it's only been a few days since they, they started. At the weekend at 1.40 a.m., they're called to Kings Hill. There's six males who are causing some sort of antisocial behaviour. This is a breach of the public space protection order. Uh, they claimed that they were playing football, albeit there was clearly alcohol involved. Our officers were able to not just take away the alcohol, but also issue a fine for the breach of the PSPO, something this council's never been able to, to do before. And as was sent out in an email to all councillors a few days ago, 
there's a golden opportunity here for all of us to make sure that we're having our concerns around antisocial behaviour addressed by this team. They're working throughout the borough and please do share with them your thoughts because we need to find out at the end of the period, the fixed term period that they're with us, whether we've got value for money from this and whether we want for it to continue. So we've got the resource that we've been asking for for a number of years. Let's use it. And of course, please say hello if you see them out and about. Your Worship, as I said, there's lots of speeches tonight, so I'm keeping mine uh, uncharacteristically, um, uncharacteristically short, my remarks for tonight. Um, but as I said, even in a short time since uh, last council meeting, so much has happened. We're progressing many projects and I'm looking forward to the progress that we continue to make. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Councillor Anita Oakley, please. Thank you, Mayor. Oh yes, Tunbridge and Morling. Um, we've got an original member um, who is also a freeman of the borough in the shape of David Thorniwell sat next to me. Um, I believe he joined uh, Tunbridge and Morning Council in 1973. And um, the council became a borough, I think, um, later. Um, we could have a mayor then, um, probably in the 80s, we think. Um, grant scheme, we welcome the grant scheme. Um, and uh, the fact that it's got lots of money available for good works around the borough. Hope that um, we can tell everyone about that. Um, air source heat pumps are very welcome at um, Larkfield Leisure Centre and the lighting and solar panels. And it sounds as if um, it's going to be an exemplar for the borough um, for um, a decarboned um, facility. Um, Sainsbury's, uh, the proposals in Tunbridge Town Centre are very welcome and of course um, come at a time when the Borough Council is also considering how best to rejig the town centre with particular emphasis on the Angel Centre, which is not far from Sainsbury's. Um, antisocial behaviour, the new antisocial behaviour enforcement team will be busy around the borough. Um, I'm hoping there won't be need to be too busy in Larkfield, but um, we do have a lot of littering around, so perhaps they can do something about that, and um, probably drinking, um, but that's about it. Thank you very much. Councillor Mark Hood, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, 50 years of Tunbridge and Morning Borough Council. Um, it's it's not been a cause for celebration in the last couple of weeks, has it, for residents in Aylesford, Larkfield, or indeed Tunbridge, who are looking at um, increased charges in our in car parks and a whole host of changes which are coming to the Overview and Scrutiny Committee um, soon. I'd like to say congratulations to um, to Councillor Colin Williams for his um, epic uh, bike ride in honour of his daughter, and I'd also like to um, congratulate him being the sole backbench member of the council who spoke at cabinet in support of the changes to uh, parking because you acknowledged exactly um, the requirements the, the needs of your community to free up parking spaces and i really admire you for that um i know that residents are dissatisfied by the council that celebrated these these 50 years um and we know that councillor hood sorry yeah. um the old, i haven't drifted yet your remarks have to be absolutely um, confined to what he raised in his announcement. Yeah, um, I, I asked for I asked for the con for some kind of uh, um, context of the leader's speech earlier and I got it at 10 minutes to six in order to, to stick rigidly to, to what he'd um, supplied me with, to, to what he said tonight. Um, the the um, presentation that the council was given um, by Sainsbury's was quite revealing because he actually revealed to us that the um, that Sainsbury's hadn't really engaged with the council. It, it came to light that what had actually happened is they decided that they're going to move into the, the building, the unit that they own next to the, the current one. Um, but they've actually they're actually going to present the building to the front of the um, to the front to face our actual land owners at, uh, at, at Angel West rather than their own car park at Angel, Angel East. So although although it's, it's massively welcome, it does kind of 
beg the question, what the hell's been going on? Um, why have MACE not been engaging um, in a meaningful way? And why has this council not been engaging with in, in a meaningful way? Because the way that they're going to, that this is going to be um, set up now means that the um, they're actually going to be opening up onto our car park where we're expecting to put um, uh, some terraced housing. Talking of terraced housing, the MACE report told us we weren't um, going to be allowed to do I've been advised that you are now um, drifting off topic, seriously off topic, I'm afraid. Okay. This, this, is, this is, this is um, okay, well, let's go to decarbonisation um, funding. So we've got £1,654,000 um, funding for uh, ground source heat pumps. And as has been pointed out, we, in order to access that money, we're having to put in 1,500, uh, 158,000 of our own funds. Um, it's fantastic that we're going to see this transition of our leisure centres to become carbon neutral at, L at Larkfield. Um, but of course, future funding is going to rely on more on more of this match funding. So this is going to have uh, an, in an impact on our future budgets. Um, I'm not quite sure that the Medway is quite the industrial archery that um, the leader has pointed out earlier. Um, it certainly um, it transformed the uh, the industrial um, history of of Tunbridge at one point. Um, but I think we do need to address the, the modern day needs of our of our communities. And I'd like to, I'd like just like to pick up on the fact that we have got huge potential here. And that's only going to be um, realised if our young people get the training that they need. And I'd just I'd like to ask Councillor Betts if he would um, if he would look into the the issues that are facing low low educationally achieving um, young people in West Kent because there's a, there's a growing problem with um, apprenticeships. So I'll, I'll just leave it there because there's not a lot really to to, to get your to get any kind of feedback on from the leader's speech. Okay, um, you, you're, you're repeat. Okay, um, I noticed that Councillor Hickmott is not present. Is there somebody from the Labour group who wishes to speak? Um, over the last 50 years, the celebration and that, it's been very good to see how that TMBC has improved and has moved forward. Um, obviously, on behalf of Councillor Hickmott and Councillor Wayne Mallard, um, we obviously add to these congratulations and positive comments. And us three, for our constituency and for our residents, we are very pleased and proud to have the opportunity to be here and to be with you all. We thank you for this and hopefully look forward to another 50 years with TMBC. In God's grace, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Mike Taylor, please. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, my best wishes to Colin as well. Um, you know, speaking as the chairman of a, a 90 year old parish council, I'd like to offer young Tunbridge and Morlin best wishes on your anniversary. Uh, the, the news about solar panels and uh, air source heating, the huge, huge amounts of money you've managed to attract, is great news. But can I just ask you? In the fullness of time, there will be other opportunities for grants for smaller projects, parish church halls, village halls. All these could benefit from um, grant funding. And if any of you, particularly the officers, hear of little grants that won't be any use to Tumbridge and Morlin, there's little parishes around the place who would be happy to receive them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, back to uh, Councillor Horton, please. Uh, Your Worship, thank you very much. And I'm grateful for all the uh, uh, remarks. It sort of makes, when I say that, it makes feel as if like I'm 50 years old. I'm not 50 years old. 
um, although I feel it. Uh, and uh, but I think this council has done great work after it was really put together in the in 1972 by uh, by the Radcliffe Maud Commission. I'm sorry that Councillor Hood doesn't feel there's a lot of feedback. Um, I appreciate that um, you may disagree at times, and it's fair enough with some of what I say, but I do think that we're doing some really good things across the borough at the minute, and I tried to mention as many as I possibly can. There is more that I could have mentioned, but as I said earlier, in the interests of time, I didn't. The Community Development Grant Scheme, fantastic. Good, smaller, local projects. Again, the sort of thing that Mike mentioned, and we've got more of that to come over uh, coming months and later in the financial year as well. I think the public sector decarbonisation scheme and our success in it is fantastic. This is hundreds of thousands of pounds that, that have been released that otherwise we would have to find the money for. And critically, as I mentioned to work the officers earlier, and I don't want to overlook this point, it's that sometimes an, an art in itself in being able to apply for some of these some of these grants and we know how to do it and we can do it again as well the west kent expo fantastic the economic regeneration team did, did a really excellent amount of work in putting that on uh, and that's brilliant as well is the river something we should celebrate yes does the river attract people to tunbridge yes does the river attract people to aylesford yes absolutely every picture you see of aylesford for example has got the river going through it every, every picture you see and every brochure you see of Tunbridge has references the fact that you've got the River Medway there. It's a big selling point for the town and we shouldn't underestimate that in the slightest as well. There's not a lot of feedback. Well, I've given you very detailed feedback about the antisocial behaviour enforcement team and they've only been going a matter of days. So yeah, lots and lots to, to say, lots of lots of good stuff happening. And I try and mention it as often as possible. I appreciate that uh, Anita Oakley and Mark would like the heads up. Um, I appreciate I sent at 10 minutes to six mark what to mark what I was writing about, but so I started writing it at 20 minutes to six. Now that's just the way I work. There's no obligation for me to write my speech more than uh, a couple of hours in advance. I work best under that sort of pressure and I will continue to do that as well. I'm sure Anita will confirm that my uh, late writing of speeches isn't a new thing either. Um, but of course, ultimately, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to do. There is a um a great opportunity across the borough to work together we're doing so and we will continue to do so as well thank you your worship thank you right moving um swiftly on um matters for decision um just going to sort of give out some ground rules amendments to the recommendations set out in reports can be proposed by any member but requires a seconder and this may require a formal roll call vote if it appears that the proposal is not supported. So item nine, uh, appointment of chief executive. Matt Borton again, please. Your Worship, it gives me great pleasure to recommend to full council that Damien Roberts be appointed as our next chief executive. Damien is an exceptional individual who has the skills, experience and ability to lead us through the next few years. He has been serving as chief executive of Surrey Heath Borough Council since 2021 prior to this held senior roles at Waverley Borough Council and Epsom and Newell Borough Council. Following the retirement of Julie Bilby in December, we commissioned Gayton B Sanderson to help with our recruitment process for the next chief executive. They helped produce a high calibre of candidate to see us through this process. I'd like to thank their team for their expertise and advice, as well as praise into the role of our head of HR and development, Matt Brooks, who uh, very professionally supported us during what was a very difficult process at times. On Wednesday, the 13th of March, 2024, we held a series of interviews with five candidates and each of them brought different qualities to the role. I want to say every single one of them performed incredibly well. Anita Oakley, Martin Coffin and I, as a panel that was uh, appointed by full council in December, then had a very long, detailed and I think it's fair to say difficult discussion, sat over in the Mayor's Parliament, a parlour for quite some time about the best candidates for the job. We eventually settled on Damien and I'm very pleased he accepted subject to the ratification that I trust we'll receive tonight. Damien is currently in employment, as I said, with Surrey Heath Borough Council, so he must work out his notice period. We expect him to join in July. Consequently, it is necessary for us to extend the interim arrangements to date that, that exist to date 
and to exist uh, hopefully until Damien starts. And I'm hugely grateful to Adrian Stanfield, Sharon Shelton and Joy Kadigo, who's obviously not with us tonight, for agreeing to continue their interim arrangements. Adrian, Sharon and Joy have performed their respective roles excellently, and I'd like to pay particular tribute to Adrian, who has fulfilled his role as interim chief executive Lee so well, in addition to his substantive post as director of central services. Damien has asked me to pass on to you all tonight how much he's looking forward to starting as our new chief executive and serving the residents of Tunbridge and Morlin. I hope with your support we can agree this tonight and Damien can join us as soon as possible. Your Worship, thank you. Thank you. Um, right, okay. Uh, any, oh, hello, right, uh, Councillor Anita Oakley, please. I'd like to second the appointment of Damien Roberts to the post of Chief Executive. Also, the separate roles of Returning Officer and Electoral Registration Officer. I fully support the um, appointment of uh, Damien. All five of the candidates were more than worthy of their place at interview. They all performed splendidly, but Damien, as been indicated in the report, was the standout candidate for all the panels. I felt the process guided by Gayson B. Sanderson was rigorous and challenging. Damien came across as calm, confident, and very knowledgeable. I am confident that he will provide strong, knowledgeable leadership whilst suggesting innovative ways to move forward, but at the same time taking all staff and members with him. I think Damien's appointment is a positive step into the future, and I fully support the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, anybody else wish to speak? Mark Hood, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, the, um, I really hope that um, Damien Roberts is going to be um, a huge success at the, um, in his position. I wish him every every success indeed. Um, it was really interesting, actually. I, in the end, um, I was not. We the the um, selection panel was only only three members, and we discussed that previously that it was a little odd having just three members to appoint the most important officer within the council. But that's been gone. Um, we were, however, able to. Um, interview there was a group there's a group i think five of five other councillors and i was one of those that interviewed all five candidates and they were an impressive bunch um part of the process also involved um them having the opportunity to ask us some questions and that was very that was very illuminating i think i'm looking at um councillor tanner over there into council Pierce, um because what they they asked us some questions about the way that we run the council in the way that we do. And they asked us questions uh, such as, why don't we engage meaningfully in more partnership working? And that's, I think all of them said, all, all of them or nearly all of them um, asked that question. And nearly all of them also asked the question is, of, you've got a huge budget gap. Why is it that you don't seem to address that budget gap when it keeps moving down the line and you don't, and you don't um, seriously tackle that? So I'm really hoping that Damien is the, the man who's going to address two of those problems and many more of the problems that we've got because I, th I found that process really, really, um, really useful and I wish him all the best. Thank you very much. Are there any other councillors wishing to speak? If not, then I will move to the uh, recommendations which are on page 30 of the packs or on your tablets or whatever way at 1.10. Um, now, I can take them individually or I can take them on block. Is that okay, Alison? Happy to move it on block? Second, David, you happy to second? Second that. Thank you, David. Right, to move on block, which is recommendations 1.10.1 to 1.10.6. Uh, to take them all, um, do I have your agreement to those which I can take by general affirmation, please? Thank you. Okay, that is agreed. Thank you. 
Um, moving on, item 10. Changes to the Constitution, Council Procedure Rule 5.5. Questions from members. Uh, Adrian, that's you. Thank you, Worship. Um, I don't propose to say too much about this myself. Um, the report is in the name of the monitoring officer, um, who at the moment is um, Joy Ukadike. Um, and the reason I don't propose to say too much is because the driver for this really came from members themselves rather than from officers. And we dealt with the technical bits, um, i.e. redrafting the constitution. Um, so, Your Worship, with your permission, perhaps if I can invite either Councillor Borton um, or Councillor Taylor to speak um, to this item. Thank you, Adrian. Um, Councillor Bolton, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Worship. Uh, I'm going to trust that members have, have, have read the papers and have engaged throughout their respective groups. I know that the Conservative group, when we discussed it, had a number of good ideas that were put forward. When this was discussed with group leaders, um, we looked at different ways to achieve different aims. The purpose of this was to, uh, I would say, update and modernise the way that we are able to re reflect the views of residents in our wards and ask questions at full council meetings and make that more open and transparent. And I'm grateful to all members who fed back. I think the proposals set out are fair, they are reasonable, and um, critically, they are open and transparent. So very happy to propose them. Councillor Mike Taylor, please. Thank you very much. Um, we put a lot of work in over the last few months, making sure that questions to all council were transparent and accessible to all members. Because I know from my own history that by the time you get around to asking a question from all council, you've exhausted every other possible avenue of information and they get asked by frustration. And I think the changes we made to the Constitution fulfil what I would have wanted to see. So I'm happy with things exactly as they are. So I'm happy to second the, the leader. Councillor Mark Hood, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the in general, the changes seem um, really sensible in making the process more transparent to those watching online. Uh, as now, at least they're going to be able to see and hear the questions and the answers, and members can also add a uh, ask a supplementary question if necessary. However, the change there's a significant change here. Although there's lots of good stuff here that the Green Group supports, when we look at the change regarding urgent questions, um, there's now a 10, a 10 working day limit. You've got to get your, your question in 10 working days beforehand. Now, I absolutely agree that getting the question in 10 working days, if you can, is the best idea. That's, that's the ideal. Because then officers and, um, and members have got the, uh, the, the requisite amount of time to uh, come back with the most comprehensive uh, reply possible. I think that is absolutely appropriate. However, a week in politics is a long time. Two weeks is an awful long time. So what I am um, going to propose as an amendment is adding at 5.5 additional wording. And so it continues and says, it says questions can be presented no later than 1600 hours on the working day prior to the date of the meeting on the understanding that a reply may not be comprehensive given the limited time frame. Nobody expects um, officers or councillors to leap through hoops and to try and come up with something that's, that's unreasonable. But that 10 days is a long time and I, th I think that this is a this is a compromise because I think this that element of this has been 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 overlooked well I'm hoping it's been overlooked because if it hasn't been overlooked and it's an admission by de by design then it's that's a re very regrettable and so that is my that is my proposal Councillor Lee Athwell, please I wanted to second that proposal Is 
anybody wish to speak on the amendment first? Councillor Bolton, then Councillor Blakey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Worship. I do understand the purpose of the amendment that's been put forward, but I have a, a, a couple of concerns about it that I wanted to articulate. This isn't actually about questions, this is about answers, because what we want is answers, we don't want questions. And Michael's absolutely right in saying that a question to full council is, or should be, a last resort. The concern with urgent questions is that it kind of takes away the fundamental principle of what we were trying to achieve by making change. Last time we had a few questions at a council meeting, we had them submitted a day or two before under the current um, guidance. And I remember one question needed a particular officer to answer it, and that particular officer was on annual leave that day. And the issue was that the question just simply couldn't be answered to the uh, appropriate level of depth that I think the questioner would have expected. So it's important to be able to have in place a deadline that is sufficiently far in advance that means that whatever the question and whatever the uh, level of detail in the question or whether it's an overarching strategic thing, the member answering the question is able to get as much feedback and advice, uh, particularly from officers if they need to speak to them, um, in advance of that. Critically, though, I need to talk about supplementary questions, because all supplementary questions can just be asked on the night with no warning whatsoever. And I think that's really important because actually you get an answer to a question and sometimes that produces a question in itself. And that is available to all questioners and provided it's um it's linked to the the purpose of the question that that will remain and obviously we don't necessarily have that at the moment i also think there's a question sorry this is going to sound a bit weird there is a question about what is an urgent question that needs answering as well um obviously we have urgent items but urgent items are not used because we don't have any other business in council meetings um, or not uh, not used unless there's, there's an absolute reason to do so. So I think bearing in mind all of the principles that we sought to achieve, which was to get high quality answers, what has been come up tonight, which has been subject of a lot of debate and consultation, particularly between group leaders, I think is a fair and reasonable um, set of guidance for us to use. And ultimately, if there's a matter that would require an urgent question at that um at, at that period then of course that may even qualify as an urgent item itself so in my view the amendment isn't um is, isn't necessary and seeks to undermine some of the principles that we look to achieve by making these changes thank you your worship councillor cloakey please uh i agree with councillor hood's proposal here i was going to suggest something along very similar lines uh obviously uh, appropriate notice for a question to give a complete and detailed answer is best, but sometimes we run the risk of letting the best be the enemy of the good. Um, we would rather have a full and comprehensive question, but if something comes up for whatever reason, that means that we don't have those 10 clear days. Um, some answer is likely to be better than no answer, even if the answer is that um, it will take longer to put that information together and the appropriate um, person will write to the questioner with the with the answer at a later date. Um, I would say that uh, we are better off providing some routes towards information than none at all, uh, on the understanding that obviously it is ideal if people can get their questions in in good time. Councillor Mike Taylor. Thank you, Chairman, uh, Your Worship. Perhaps Adrian could answer this. As I understand it, if something urgent did happen, like Tunbridge Castle burnt down two days ago, the Mayor has the right to accept that as a question to this Council. Is that correct? And that's correct. And only the Mayor has the authority at Council to accept urgent business, um, and that's provided in the Local Government Act 1972. Councillor Mark Rhodes, please. Your Worship, thank you. Um, it's a odd 
amendment, I think personally, um, especially well that it, it, it states that the uh, that the uh, there, there is an understanding that the answer will be comprehensive. I cannot support that, Chairman. Any other councillors listening to speak? Mark Hood, please. Just uh, just as a point of, of clarification, can, can Councillor Rhodes, are you was the the issue that the that the the, uh, the the request was that the answer would not be comprehensive that you were objecting to this? Worship, can I answer the question? You may you may answer. Yes, certainly. Um, Councillor, what I'm saying is that the amendment states, does it not? That the understanding is that the reply might not be comprehensive. I think it's a badly worded amendment, but I'm still not supporting it. Councillor Hood. Great, thank you very much for that. Thanks, thank you, Councillor Rhodes. Um, yeah, the, the the simple fact of the matter is, I'm really confused by um, what uh, Councillor Borton said. That um, obviously supplementary questions can only be uh, can only relate specifically to a submitted question that's already been that's already been put before the council um we don't have urgent answers and we don't have any other any other business and i would have thought that this is the arrangement that we've had we've always had that i'm asking that i'm asking that we we continue with this but it's best practice that you have 10 days beforehand as an as the ideal so i'm i'm just a little it just this just is the usual Control for a career, this council, isn't it? The Borton, please. For months we've tried to work and we have worked cross party on this issue. So it's a bit disappointing that Councillor Hood reverts to just throwing stuff like control for degree. I mean, if you want to build trust and build relationships, which I've spent and others spent a long time trying to do, just hurling petty little remarks like that don't go very far towards achieving that aim. This isn't about control freakery. This is about making sure that the business of the council is conducted as it should be. It's about making sure we have high quality answers at the meeting available for residents and members of the council and anyone who takes an interest in the business to be able to see. If you accept that answers will not be comprehensive at a meeting, then when will a comprehensive answer be provided? How does that get recorded in the minutes? How does that get publicised? I think we've opened, we open up a can of worms. Sorry, I think we open up a can of worms here. And personally, I see nothing wrong with what was proposed that was pulled together after a lot of input from different people. And there shouldn't be a need, just like we have so few urgent items, there shouldn't really be a need for urgent questions in that sense because questions to councils and we had we didn't have any tonight and that's fine because i hope that means that the council is accessible to members and they're able to get answers to their questions through different ways and i have to say members and officers in my experience are very good at that so this is a we're talking about a last resort anyway i don't think we necessarily need to open up a can of worms as the amendment would um would do and that's why I'm I'm not supporting. Thank you, um, Councillor Athwell. This is going around in ever decreasing circles, so we'll make this the last comment, please. Thank you. I'll just um, be brief. I just see it slightly differently. I I completely get the need for notice if you want to have a a really good answer, but I also feel like trust is about being able to bring up what's top of mind when we come to these meetings. And I feel as though it's difficult sometimes to be able to know what's going to come up in two weeks time, you know, before a meeting. And if something does and it's important and it's a burning issue, I think, why not share it? We're not bringing it up because anybody wants to beat somebody up with something. I want this is about an atmosphere of trust so that people can come to meetings. And if something has come up, within the last two weeks, they can at least raise it because then we can work together on getting it sorted, agreed and taken forward. So I see this differently. I think this is a real matter of trust and not being able to speak and bring something up. You know, it's difficult to feel that you're not able to do that with your colleagues in the chamber. So that's why I'm supporting the motion.
Councillor Afwell has just described to an extent an urgent okay. item. If the matter is urgent okay. and the, the mayor wishes to, whoever the mayor is, wishes to accept it, then as, as Mr Stanfield described, the mayor is able to, to, to do so. We're not a debating society. We are here to conduct the business of the council and to deliver services for residents. We mustn't lose sight of that. OK, I think this has gone round and round. And well, I did say, David, but I will let you have one last one. That's it then. I'm going to say we don't actually get many questions. Um, so for me, this is not a, a particularly big issue. I did wonder when I read this limited ink to one question per member. I'm always concerned about when things get limited and five questions allowed at a meeting. And as I read this, it doesn't relate to the procedure which hardly anyone ever uses of the public coming and asking questions. So that could be another tranche of questions as I understand it. Um, and my view is, let's suck it and see, I think, because um, I don't want to make it more complicated. Um, but I do want to see how, how this works out in practice, and I hope we would be willing to revisit it if problems occur. Thank you. Thank you. Right. OK, I think that we need to move to a vote on the amendment, firstly, and then we can, depending on the result of that, move to the substantive motion. Um, Alison, how would you like to... Is a roll call? Do it as a roll call. Roll call, please. Yeah. yeah. And we are voting on the amendment proposed by Councillor Hood, seconded by Councillor Apple, relating to urgent questions after the deadline of 10 days. If you're in favour of that amendment, please indicate or. Um, do you want to start with the I can, certainly. Um, against. James Lark, against. against. Councillor Hammond. Against. Councillor Athol. Or. We've had apologies from Councillor Banks. Councillor Barton. Or. Councillor Bell. Against. Councillor Benison. Or. Councillor Betts. <coughs> oh, God. Blimey. Oh, dear. Okay. What was that? Against. <laughs> Councillor Bishop. <laughs> Like Councillor Bishop. Against. Councillor Bolton. Against. Councillor Boxall. Against. Councillor Bridge. Against. Councillor Brown. Against. Councillor Cannon. Against. Councillor Cokey. For. Councillor Coffin. Against. Councillor Copes. Councillor Crisp. For. Councillor Dalton. Against. Councillor Davis. Against. Councillor Dean. Against. Councillor Harmon. Against. Just from Councillor Hickmott. Councillor Hines. For. Councillor Hoskins. For. Sorry, I've. Councillor Hood. Councillor Hood. I think I better vote for. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Hudson. Against. Councillor Kears. Against. Councillor King. Against. Councillor Mallard. Apologies. Councillor McDermott. Against. Councillor Mehmet. Against. Councillor Oakley. Against. Councillor yeah. Oliver. Or. Councillor Palmer. Against. Councillor Parry. Or. Councillor Rhodes. Against. Councillor Roud. Against. Councillor Tanner. Against. Councillor Tatton. Councillor Taylor. Against. Councillor Thornywell. Against. Councillor Tunstall. Against. And last but not least, Councillor Williams. Against. And that is motion is lost. Right, now we need to vote on the... Oh, hello. Sorry, I also wanted to speak on the, uh, on the motion as it was uh, since we've only discussed the amendment, if that's OK. OK. Yep. Um, so my concerns, particularly on 5.5.2, the limit of five questions per meeting. 
Um, that does really seem to be a solution looking for a problem. We're hardly uh, overwhelmed with questions. I don't know if anyone can think of the last time we had five questions, all from different members, because obviously there's also a one question per member limit in one of the other sections. Uh, and it does raise the question, uh, I don't know if someone can assist here, um, which questions are selected if too many questions are submitted? And um, is, sorry, did someone want to answer that? Yes, please, Councillor Borton, if you can provide uh, an answer. I think the constitution has to be fit to survive the test of time and the changeover of members. It might be a different cohort. There may be 44 other people this time, and those 44 other people may like to ask lots of questions, perhaps more than this current cohort does. And something that we discussed, and I think there was general unanimity from those who I've discussed this with in the Conservative group and across group leaders, was that we it's it's reasonable to set a limit somewhere. A limit of five questions per meeting, as said and as David Forney well said, pretty much would never be met at the moment. But in the interests of actually making sure meetings finish, that would be that's quite important. Given all of the other business that's that's on the agenda, it was felt that five was a sensible level. As was said, this is something that we can look at again in the future. So if it turns out that we have lots of um lots of questions that are being submitted, then we could look to increase that. It doesn't change take much other than a change to the constitution, because there's no right or wrong place to put it. In terms of how they will be selected, that will be done on a first come first serve basis. Questions are submitted via the officers and uh, democratic services will advise just as what happens at the moment in terms of the order of business and sort of when when a valid question is received and that one will be taken for the second one, second, third one, third, the fourth one, fourth and the fifth one, fifth and I think that's the fairest way. Thank you. You wish to come yeah. back? So my, my concern on that is uh, you're, uh, it's quite right that the um, the behaviour of the council may change, and um, one potential problem with a finite set of questions coming on a first come first serve basis is that a uh, a less collegiate and well behaved group might uh, try and pack the questions, get all their get all the questions in first, block everybody else out. Um, so. That's obviously avoided if there's no limit to questions. If there are a large number of questions asked, obviously that could be a problem for a maximum of one meeting before we went in and put a limit on it. In that, for that one meeting, there are um, the possibilities that we use the motions without notice to adjust the agenda to shove the questions to the end and then potentially adjourn the meeting after uh, it drags on for too long. Um, so I would say that uh, it is probably better if we. Uh, deleted that section, we could always add it later if it became necessary. That's all. Uh, Councillor Bolton, please. I mean, this is hard because the, you, it, it's hard to say whether this will be five is right or six is right, four is right. Just don't know. In my five years on the council, I don't think I could have ever have been in a meeting when there's been more than five questions or where there's been more than one question per member. If David's shaking his head, then uh, given that we learnt that he was around at the first meeting of the council, perhaps it's been longer than five years and the previous 45 as well. But perhaps, but I think that it's just, just being pragmatic in terms of we've got to set a limit. Let's set a limit that hasn't been reached before. If we go over that limit in the future, it's not the hardest thing in the world to change. Councillor David Thornywell. I can't resist answering that. I can't... Re <laughs> I can't recall any meeting where five questions have been asked, to be honest. Um, and and I struggle, there's only been a few meetings where people of the public have asked questions too, which would also take up the time here. I understand what my colleague's saying, but I, I would be content to, to stand on the assurance that we will keep an eye on this and, and, and review it. As as father of the house, we, we we benefit from your years of experience on this matter. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, I suggest that we go to a vote on the original uh, substantive motion. Alison, do you want to do that by roll call, or are you going to do? It? 
I can do that by general affirmation if everybody is happy so to do. Okay, it's agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Moving onwards, item 11, programme of meetings 2024-25 and 25-26. Adrian. Nothing to add, Your Worship. Um, Anybody want an in-depth discussion on this item? Um, oh, oh, blimey. Yes. OK, yes, certainly. Please do. <laughs> it's not an in-depth discussion, but I would like to point out, if we look around this room, we are mostly people of a certain age. We are mostly people of a certain background and we're not particularly reflective of the people that we're serving. And I think one of the barriers to um, uh, new people standing as counsellors or more diverse people standing as counsellors, certainly people with children of school age, is, is when these council meetings happen. And looking at the calendar, yes, it's fantastic they're happening in the evening, but there's 11 meetings planned that are happening in school holidays, state school holidays at the time. And those who work in education, those with children, don't have any choice but to take their holidays at that time. So I'd like to ask, certainly for future consideration, that we try and avoid um, school holiday times, particularly for full council meetings. There's two full council meetings booked in the middle of state school holidays next year. You wanted to say something? Yeah, very, very briefly. The um, Yeah, I, I agree with everything that um, Councillor Barton's just said. Um, at one point, two, I know how difficult this must be for Democratic Services Officers to put this programme together. Um, at 1.22, it mentions the timing of the half-term holiday. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming we try to avoid um, these, these holidays generally. I'm aware that we do want to have a situation where we accommodate um, members and officers and that it isn't it isn't great to have a meeting as we are now having a meeting in the in the in the easter holidays i find this odd i don't think this is favorite at all um because officers should be able to go away as well and in the past we've had meetings in this room where officers have, have been away and then they've been forced to take all their take their stuff with them and they, they take their resources with them and then they have to beam in with uncertain um, Wi-Fi. Yeah, uh, yeah. But this is, this is, uh, this is yeah, Councillor Hudson's quite right. Officers, when they're on holiday, they're on holiday. They shouldn't be expected to have to, to take part in online meetings. So if we could look at that, I, that would be, if we could bear it in mind in the future, this isn't a criticism. I think it's something that we should be able to work around because officers deserve holidays too. Thank you. Um, I'm sure that the officers would be very grateful for your things, as well as some officers too uh, and, and members too. Not like us poor old Wrinkleys who've done our bit with children and been through all the hell. Um, and back. But uh, yeah, its point is taken. And I see that Alison was sort of not nodding furiously at certain points there too. So she clearly slightly agrees. Um, right. Um, I think that that is something to bear in mind in the future. But um, can I, um, if there are any objections to the matter being agreed, um, if there aren't any, can I take it by general affirmation, please? Right. Item. 12 biodiversity net gain monitoring um who have we got here uh, it's got... chelsea honey bradfield oh. I'm, I'm doing remotely that's fine chelsea thank you very much all with you uh, so many of you are probably aware that i i'm the senior development obligations officer um mainly dealing with section 106 at the moment and i've had a lot of correspondence with various councillors um, the item on the agenda relates to the BNG monitoring fees that we're uh, looking to implement. A bit of background, the BNG legislation has become mandatory for all applications now, large and or anything that's basically over a householder, meaning they'd have to provide an offset of 10% um, for BNG when they're completing their development. 
um, to assist in this, we're going to be seeking to charge a monitoring fee, which would need to cover a 30 year period to ensure that the 10 percent provision is provided either on site or off site. Um, and so we have to undertake sort of the research into this. We've taken various different approaches to see which way would best suit the council um, and we've we've come out with the recommendation that we think would best suit our needs to one cover the the monitoring costs that are going to be sort of that we're going to have to take on but also providing a fair service across the board as well um, so we've used uh, the the calculator we have used in order to outcome with the figures has been provided by a company called mycelia which is the software that we are we have purchased for a year um a year trial sorry to undertake the assessment reporting and monitoring of bng um the figures that we've used in that is a across the board median of the officer salaries which rates from various scales um alongside sort of a 31% overhead that the LPA has to cover and a 3% inflation rate, which is sort of on an average basis. Um, all of our fees have been checked by our finance colleagues as well, I must stress that. Um, the fees are shown in option one, which would amount to a annual um, spend of for monitoring fees, so an annual sort of provision of monitoring fee cost of about £81,000. That is um, sort of a very basic, it would be an across the board flat fee, it doesn't, doesn't matter on the site, uh, the scheme size. The fees in option two, they we've based those on varying scheme sizes, which have been provided by sort of the government guidelines set out when it comes to B&G. However, I must stress that those are very large, scheme sizes and they don't tend to meet the requirement that or the, the sort of schemes we see as a local council um, and so we are looking to implement option three which would provide TNBC with an annual monitoring uh, fee of about £59,000 towards monitoring costs and it would basically it goes across different scheme sizes that are more suitable to what we see as a local council. Um, the way we calculated these figures was done by a median of applications received over a five year period to ensure we could get an average amount of what we would likely to see as an income. Um, and so we can sort of have a look at it on a, on a better scale and that is not just impacted by sort of COVID and everything like that. Um, so yeah, if, the, if anybody's got any questions, please, let me know and I'll try to answer them as best as I can. Anything from members? Roger, that's not you with your hand up, is it? It's just, no, that's fine. Okay, just waving. Um, no questions? That's fine. Okay. Well, thank you, Chelsea, for your full explanation. Um, I'm going to move these recommendations at 1.8, which is page 51 of the agenda pack. And um, are there any objections to this matter? These recommendations being agreed, please. Agreed. Thank you. Those are so agreed. Thank you. Um, moving swiftly onwards. Um, item 13, housing services staffing. Uh, GP uh, Chair, Councillor Mark Rhodes, please. Chairman, thank you. Well, your Worship, thank you. Um, this matter was debated fully in part two at GP. Uh, the recommendation, Chair, your worship is before you, uh, which results in positive outcomes. I would like to recommend this to Council, your worship. Councillor Kim Tanner. I'll second that, um, your worship. And I'd just like to say that um, this is um, following on from recommendations of a recent review that we had of the housing team where they recognised that we had previously been seriously under-resourced and they recommended that we try to retain the very, very good staff that we've managed to, to um, source from agencies. Um, and so I hope the council can agree that we make these fixed term, uh, rather permanent contracts. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kim. Um, that has been proposed and seconded. Um, again, I would hope to take it by general affirmation. Are there any objections to this matter? These recommendations being agreed. Agreed. Thank you. So agreed. Uh, item 14. Feedback from consultation results of the scrap metal dealers policy 2024 to 2029. Um, Councillor Chris Brown. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to move the uh, recommendation of the Licensing and Appeals Committee held on the 26th of March. And uh, the details are set out on page one of the supplement pack. Thank you. Dennis King. Um, I'm happy to second the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you. Those have been proposed and seconded. Are there any objections to this matter? Recommendations being agreed, please. Thank you. Item 15, minutes of cabinet and committees. Uh, the minute book, volume two, has been published as a supplement. As this is a matter for information, uh, can this be received as noted, please? Thank you. Um, I now would seek your agreement that authority be given for the common seal of the council to be affixed to any instrument to give effect to a decision of the council incorporated into these minutes and proceedings. Thank you very much. Uh, that yeah, brings this meeting to a close at 9.28, uh, but we are following straight on with a special meeting. Um, now, this special meeting is to consider a motion to admit 220 Medical Squadron 256 City of London and South East Multi-Role Medical Regiment as honorary freemen in recognition of their eminent services to the borough of Tunbridge and Morling. Um, now, um, I will give you some background to this, and I know that certain other councillors, there are five signatures already to this um, uh, proposition. Um, I went to the formation of this new regiment, which is um, a fantastic um, affair. It's based at Ditton. Ditton is the only male uh, adult service base within Tunbridge and Morling. The rest are all cadets, basically. Um, and they have a huge history. Um, 1885 um, for 256 Field Hospital and 1897 when a typhoid outbreak happened, uh, a local typhoid outbreak happened. Luckily, we don't have local typhoid outbreaks anymore. Um, but um, they are all reservists supported by regular officers. These, I met them, I met them all. They are wonderful people. They basically are all NHS doctors, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, and then they do that job, which can its own, on its own be fairly thankless, but they then go and give up their time to do this reserve occupation with the army. Um, the last thing that they helped us out with in this borough, um, and which they had a huge effect on, was, of course, the dreaded, and I hate to mention it, COVID outbreak. Um, and they are the very first people to stick their head over the parapet, get up and support us, and they do it all with a smile um, and with great grace and efficiency. Um, I met them and they were actually truly inspiring. And that's why I thought that, yes, it would be absolutely wonderful to offer them the Freeman of the Borough. Um, 254 Medical Regiment, 220 Squadron, um, being based in Ditton, of course, Maidstone in 1998 gave them freedom of Maidstone, which it sort of slightly stick up my nose, but hey ho, um, you know, we're always, there we are, good old Maidstone. Um, and I have, I have the proposers, um, I said that I would propose, Councillor Matt Borton did, uh, our two armed forces champions, Dave Davis and Steve Hammond, and also Councillor Anita Oakley um, was happy to sign that. So I have um, pleasure in proposing that um, in recognition of their eminent services to the borough of Tunbridge and Morling, uh, they be admitted as an honorary freeman of the borough pursuant to section 249 stroke 5 of the local government act 1972 uh, anybody else wish to say dave davis please uh, thank you your worship uh, within the army there are uh, it's divided into arms and services 
There are six arms, the infantry, the tanks, the artillery, uh, the engineers, signals, and uh, the air, uh, people who operate drones and helicopters. Um, the services, there are numerous services uh, that help those guys close and fight with the enemy. Uh, uh, and the one of the most critical ones uh, in every respect is uh, the uh, other medics. Um, they're one of the absolute key services within the, the army. Uniquely, they don't carry any weapons uh, as a matter of course, because it's part of the Geneva Convention, and they provide their uh, support to both sides, enemy combatants and our own. Um, they are uh, uniquely right up in the front line, often within 100 metres of the front line uh, with regimental aid posts and this sort of thing. And they go right the way back in the casualty evacuation system. The first people to go, the first people to go and get the casualties are the combat medics, unarmed stretcher bearers and paramedics who can go in, go in. They are one of the most decorated um, units in the British Army, so uh, corps, corps in the British Army, with a very, very proud tradition in battle. Uh, the Territorial Army are, uh, as you rightfully say, uh, largely people who are employed in the medical services in, uh, 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 in, in peacetime. But they do give up a lot of time uh, 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 for their annual camp and for, for regular training to bring them up to the standard where they can leave the nice, comfortable uh, hospitals we live in and move into the sort of place that we see on our television screens in Gaza and that sort of thing, very, very close to the action which is going on. These people, these people from Ditton, not only do this in training, which is always hard. We train. The army has a tradition of training hard and hopefully fighting easy, but it seldom works out that way. And these people have actually gone out on operations to support the re the regular army in recent uh, operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. So it's with great pride that I personally support this uh, this thing. Thank you. Is anybody else wish to say anything or can we move to a vote on that? Um, now I can take this vote by general affirmation unless there is somebody completely to the contrary. So can I take this as a general affirmation? The proposal is that, that we announce that 220 Medical Squadron 256 City of London and South East Multi-Role Medical Regiment is admitted as Honorary Freeman to the Borough of Tunbridge and Morning. Thank you very much. And uh, that concludes the, according to Adrian, the record-breaking third council meeting of the evening. It's never happened on your watch, has it? No. And that uh, closed the meeting at 9.34. Thank you very much for a long evening and safe journeys home. Thank you.